Hey, this is Frank Honus, and I want to welcome you to the Pure Life Podcast, helping individuals live with sexual integrity through Jesus Christ. Well, hey, everyone. This is Frank Honus. I want to welcome you to episode 93 of the Pure Life Podcast. I'm excited this week to be able to talk to a new friend, uh, a brother, who is uh, in in kind of the same – we're doing the same work with men, exciting work, helping men with sexual integrity and their character and sexual purity, um, helping them overcome – uh, sexual struggles. Um, as you know, the Pure Life Podcast exists to help those who are struggling with sexual addictions find integrity, find sexual integrity through Jesus Christ. And I'm just honored and really blessed to be able to, to talk to Dr. T.C. Ryan, uh, who is actually the author of a book called Ashamed No More, Ashamed No More, A Pastor's Journey Through Sex Addiction. Uh, and this is from InterVarsity Press, uh, InterVarsity Press Books. Um, and, and I've just started to dig into this book this weekend, and this is just a fantastic uh, read. It's very, uh, it's got a lot of great information. I can't wait to start kind of really just diving into this and, and, and chewing it up and, and digesting it. This is really great. And uh, I reached out to, uh, I reached out to Tom probably a few weeks ago, um, a couple weeks ago, found his story on YouTube, and um, just I just got this sense from you, Tom, that you're just you are a man who's on this journey, uh, and, and there's nothing fancy about your story or about who you are necessarily, but the work that God has done in your life to to bring healing and to bring recovery in your life from sexual addiction. That's a, such a powerful story. And so when I saw your story, I found it on YouTube. I just thought to myself, man, I got to get a hold of this guy. I want to talk to him. I want to dissect his brain a little. I mean, not literally, but yeah, you know, I want to dissect his brain and and talk to him about, you know, he's a former pastor. Talk to him about pastoral ministry and and sexual addiction and all kinds of stuff. So I just reached out to Tom and and he was just so gracious enough to uh, give me a phone call, give me an email back, and then a phone call. So Tom, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you so much for being on the podcast this week. Well, it's my privilege. I mean, really, and I appreciated you reaching out to me, Frank, and and it gave me an opportunity to kind of look at some of the things that you've been posting and doing. And man, I so applaud you and thank you for what you're doing. Um, so yeah, it's good. Well, I want to just for a second, Tom, if that's all right with you, before we kind of jump into uh, some some Q and A, will you? Just describe a little bit about the work that you do with men and and what you're doing right now. I mean, I know you were a former pastor at one time, uh, but right now you're kind of a kind of a pastor to pastors, kind of a coach uh, to ministry leaders. I mean, just g- give us a little bit idea of what you do right now. Your work with men uh, and individuals. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for asking. Uh, there's multiple facets to what I'm doing right now. It's really an interesting period in my life. So. Uh, part of what I do is I run two different recovery groups. In uh, I live in the Kansas City area, and uh, my wife and I live here. In uh, and uh, so for several years, for about three years now, I've run um, a recovery group for sex addicts. Uh, they're made up primarily of guys that go to the church that we now attend. The church when we left our church that we'd planted, uh, we went to a friend's church, and that's where we've been ever since. And uh, so about three, three and a half years ago, as an experiment to see, can you do a sexual addiction recovery group rather than a kind of a general anonymous one in communities like we have quite a few, um, can you do one, excuse me for the phone, I, I forgot to block it. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's bad, Frank. That's one of my daughters. She's on the East Coast with you right now. Uh, oh, you might want to answer that phone call. Well, no, 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 no. She's she's probably calling to talk to her mom primarily, <laughs> so she'll call Pam's cell phone. Um, and I will make up for that later. So yeah, oh, it's yeah. all good. It, it's all it is all good. Yeah. Um, so so I do a recovery group for guys, and it's kind of an experiment. Can we really do a sex addiction recovery group in a church? Now we protect anonymity. Of the guys, we don't publicize where exactly the group meets, what time it meets, but um, in the very back of my book, I put the protocol for it. We call it the Shame No More uh, group, and um, 
and it's it's based on twelve step model uh, groups. It's very similar to AA formats, but it's 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 uh, kind of recalibrated to specifically match um, a church ethos. So we talk very clearly about Jesus being the higher power and those kinds of things. But we use the twelve steps and. And I do allow some some conversation in the group as opposed to strict no crosstalk rules that are that are generally what what you would find in twelve step groups. So I run that group and and deal with those guys. And there's lots of conversations that I have during the week. I also have a group, uh, another uh, confidential group for clergy only for ministry leaders. And I've had that one for a lot of years. I had that before I got to a place where I had my own sobriety in any kind of a sustained format. Mm -hmm. um, I do some speaking. I do some preaching still. Uh, in fact, I'm doing more preaching now these days, and um, I speak to groups, men's groups. I just spoke at a couple of men's retreats this month, and that was that was great. I speak to youth groups, uh, and then a new venture. I'm um, doing a little bit of speaking for a secular group of uh, uh, alcohol and all addiction treatment centers called Elements, and so. Um, uh, the thing I bring, I'm not a clinical psychologist, I'm not a, th a therapist, but mm -hmm. I've used a lot of therapy, and God used therapy to really help me get to this place of of healthier living and of, of a healthier mindset. And I, uh, so, uh, addiction, as you know, Frank, is a spiritual issue, right. but it incorporates our minds as well as our bodies, and and. Um, and we gotta we gotta recover our minds, like Paul talks about in, in Romans twelve one and two. We have to learn how to transform our minds, and it's one thing to believe that; it's another thing to do it. And sometimes there's hiccups in our souls. And mm -hmm. in my case, there were some really deep uh, issues, and I needed to have some professional help. I just flat out did, and it took a long time to get to where I needed to go. Um, I I feel like Frank, uh, and I'm not alone in this. All healing that we get in this life, it, God's the Father of it. All good gifts come from the Father of Light. So, whether it's a therapist I'm using, or a group of sport, or accountability partner, or uh, talking honestly with my spouse, reading a memorizing scripture, whatever the tools are that we bring into our own recovery, mm -hmm. God's the one who gives us mercy and grace, and and even the desire for finding light and finding wholeness and, and finding our way out of the, the dark places that we can stumble into. And um, certainly that's been the case uh, for me. So that's a, that's a little, I'm doing a little speaking then for this group of treatment centers. So I know that all is con convoluted, but that, that's what I'm doing. So That's awesome. Um, Tom, how far back, take us back through your life a little bit. How far back did your sexual struggles go? Uh, when were you first exposed to, you know, sexually explicit material, pornography? Uh, you know, when did uh, that derailment, if you will, kind of yeah. begin to take place in your life? Yeah, that's an interesting question because most of the guys I talk to that have become compulsive with how they use sex can pinpoint the first exposure, the first encounter with somebody, or the first... Uh, time they saw something. And I, and I can remember, I don't remember exactly the age I was. I mean, I was very young. It was before I actually started engaging in, in practices myself. But the first time I actually saw a pornographic image, uh, my parents had gone to a social gathering at somebody else's house. There were a group of adults. The adults had all brought their kids, and we were playing in the basement or someplace. And I go upstairs to go use the uh, bathroom, and I remember walking through the back of the room where the adults were, and a guy was, this is in the early 60s, so we're mm -hmm. talking uh, Playboy thing has just come out, and all that's kind of bursting onto the scene. And, and, I, and I, I can still look across that room of adults, Frank, and see this guy holding up this pinup, this centerfold wow. out of this magazine. Wow. And I can still picture the guy in his chair where the lamp was beside him and this image of this naked woman. And I, I'm a little kid, but mm -hmm. man, did that lock into me. It, it was just, it just locked in. So come forward a number of years later now, just a few years later, early adolescence. So we've got all those natural urges to, you know, you're starting to become aware of your own sexuality, the sexuality of others, sure. and all that. And uh, this imagery of this woman, I don't remember her specifically, but it just, it just fueled this whole intrigue about sex. So I, I was kind of slow, kind of a uh, introverted kid. I uh, wasn't socially very out there. Um, but when I discovered lust and imagination and then masturbation, self-gratification, 
what it was, Frank, as I go back down, pulled apart all the different factors in my life, I was very alone. There were some abuse factors. Mm -hmm. That doesn't excuse anything. That doesn't take the responsibility away from me. My life really is my life. Um, you know, our choices really are our choices, and we have to take responsibility for those. But sometimes, when we, particularly when we get stuck with something, we realize um, we got to pull apart some of the framework of how we got to where we got, how our mm -hmm. thinking got so gobbled up, and and how we began to misuse our sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so, so years later, when I was doing that kind of a work, part of what I pulled apart was some of the story that I put in in the book, uh, "A Shame No More," uh, was just the, the the loneliness and the hurt and uh, some of the neglect that happened, some of the abuse that happened, and all those things made for kind of a crazy atmosphere, where where I didn't know it was crazy. Mm -hmm. I didn't know uh, how my life was any different from anybody else's. But I was intuitively looking for ways to manage my own life, to manage craziness, to make myself feel better. And when I discovered lust and masturbation, I discovered this really great way to create an imaginary world where I was in charge yeah. and where I could really um, uh, find some kind of release and relief. And what we know now from so many different studies that have been done from by science is that neurochemically, um, I was taking a drug. I was ingesting a lot of dopamine. I was getting myself a high, if you will. I was numbing myself up. I was distracting myself, and it had a reward to it. Mm -hmm. um, but we went to church. I had a God consciousness. I really believed in God. So about as early as I started stumbling into this repetitive pattern of gratifying myself, um, I began to have these thoughts of, well, maybe this isn't right, maybe this isn't cool, and all that. But I kind of put those to the back. I didn't know, have a framework. I didn't have somebody to go talk to. I wasn't sure about that. Mm -hmm. A few years later, I'm getting more involved in a different church's youth ministry. I have some real um, encounters with Jesus Christ uh, that builds upon my, my intuitive spirituality. Um, I just really locked into the gospel. I locked into believing in God. But here's the deal. I'd been sculpting this pattern over and over and over of imagination and lust and masturbation and it had become a regular part of my routine. And what I did not realize is I developed a drug habit of sorts. Again, mm -hmm. this isn't making any excuses. It's just a reality. I'd right. become really dependent on this was how I managed my days. This is how I got through life. This is how I made myself feel better when I, uh, everything was going uh, down or when I was feeling very dark, or when I was having trouble getting myself motivated, or, or whatever it was, this became the go-to thing. I had developed a habit that had become an addiction, and I did not know that. So then as a Christian, as a young Christian, as an earnest Christian, somebody who sincerely wants to do the right thing and follow Jesus and, and believes in God, uh, I felt guilty, and I felt some shame. And... Uh, so, Frank, what I did is probably what you did, what we all do. I told God I was sorry. Um, I told myself I was not going to engage in this anymore. And mm -hmm. I meant it. I meant it. And I probably made it a few days. But you know what happens. When we're hooked, when that little monkey's become a gorilla and it's taken on a life of its own in our souls, uh, when we get distracted or we get too far down or whatever it is, we go back to our default. And I went back to my default. I broke a promise I made to myself. Well, now I'm engaging in behavior that I don't respect. Uh, what's the matter with me? There's something wrong with me. You know, wait a minute. I promised myself again. I'm not going to do this anymore. Now I'm going to promise God I won't do this anymore. But when I do it some more, I've broken my promises to God. Well, the shame that comes with that. Um, what we know now is that just reinforces the cycle of misery in a person's soul. Mm -hmm. and you start to believe really deeply entrenched truths like, you know, there's something wrong about me. Um, if people really knew who I was, they would never respect me. They wouldn't want to be with me. Um, I've broken my promises to God. God's disappointed in me. God doesn't like me anymore. Um, Maybe I'm going to hell. I don't know if I'm going to hell. I just know God doesn't care. Why would he care? Why would anybody love me? Um, I can't live without sex. That's another lie. I can't live without this thing, but I'm broken. 
and those just become the things that uh, become kind of the subplots in the back of our minds. Sure. And it's a it's a heck of a way to live. It just is a miserable way to live. Yeah. So that's a little bit. I said more than I think I over answered your question. I'm sorry. No, not at all. I I love. I mean, I love detail. I do. I I um. I, I wonder though. You, so you progress through your life. You know. Uh. You. In, you know. In your video and your story, you you mentioned that you. Uh. You became a professional Christian. There. You know. You were a professional Christian. What you mean by that is you became a pastor. Yeah. And you became so you know you're this person who's being seen and up on the platform and up on the stage. Um, maybe fast forward with us a little bit. What did it feel like to live working as a professional Christian, right? On one hand, while really struggling with a sexual addiction on the other. I mean, the, maybe just talk a little bit about the di the dichotomy between your ministry at the time as a pastor and then being someone who all, who also is struggling with. You know, sexual addiction, pornography, masturbation. I mean, how do how do those two fit together? It's a profound question. They don't, and so horrible. It it, it was horrible. I struggled with a uh, Tom. You're just a liar. You're just a hypocrite. Uh, it reinforced that faulty core belief that I had in my soul that you know there's something fundamentally wrong with me, and if anybody knew who I really was, they wouldn't want to be mm -hmm. my friend. They would run the other way. Um, yeah, uh, being in ministry for me was a point of personal obedience. I was going to be a high school English teacher, and that's what I went off to the university to do. I got involved with Young Life Leadership and some campus Bible study ministry, and some friends started to say, you know, Tom, you got gifts for ministry. We think you should go into the ministry. And, mm -hmm. and uh, again, my faith was very sincere. I didn't know that I was, quote, a sex addict. We weren't using that language back then. Um, I just knew that I, I, I had this habit, I had this thought life that wasn't right, that wasn't good, wasn't healthy. I kept repenting of it all the time. I kept asking God for help. And so that was just years of a struggle. Um, early on, I told my wife a little bit about my struggle. And, um, you know, it's terribly personal for spouses. It's horrifically personal for spouses. And how could it not be personal for, for, a, for a young um Excuse me for a young uh, a young bride to hear this um, um, deal uh, about her husband and and so when I saw the pain on my wife's face, you know maybe I'm a coward maybe I'm whatever I just said okay Jesus and I are going to fix this I don't want to I don't want to hurt Pam I don't want to talk about this anymore Jesus and I will fix this yeah and uh, you know. Isn't that what we need, Frank? Don't we tell each other the gospel that you know Jesus is all you need, and mm -hmm. and there's some there's an aspect of truth to that, but that's really a truncation of the gospel. Yeah, because Jesus does meet our needs, but he doesn't meet our needs in formulaic ways that that I might come up with. He has his own timetable, and almost invariably, Jesus uses others. He uses us in community. We need others to get to where we need to go. He doesn't do this over-westernized, over-Americanized, isolated, just me and Jesus out here on the prairie getting our act together, you know. it's No, it's community. It's the church. It's, it's uh, I need you, you need me. And uh, me going into an isolation mode in terms of handling my problem was the worst thing I could have done. So all those years when I was doing ministry, I was trying to be very sincere, and I was very sincere, but I just had this huge monkey on my back uh, that made me feel guilty and ashamed and alone. And uh, again, it just isolated me something terrible. Uh, just as kind of a side question, because I remember being a youth pastor for four years and struggling with pornography every single, uh, you know, every all four of those years, every single day for that, that season of my life. Um, and I remember how resonating with your feelings, how incredibly shameful I felt, how incredibly scared I felt. Um, I had no idea what to do, though. I had no idea who to talk to. Uh, I even remember talking to my senior pastor at one point and felt felt very almost scolded uh, for for struggling, almost you know reprimanded, um, not not really heard, not really listened to, and you know, and I just felt that you know if I continue to do this, come to him. You know, I could lose my job here, and you know, so what? I it was not a safe environment whatsoever. Right. right. And so that gave me 
maybe it was a maybe it was a wrong taste of the church. I I, sh I probably you know formed some judgments and some opinions about that, but um, it kind of gave me a little bit of a flavor of you know I don't know that the church is a very safe place for for those who are struggling with sex addiction. Would you agree with that or disagree or what? I would I would I would totally agree with that. There are just a, there are a few places now where I'm seeing churches talk about sexual brokenness in open and in grace-based ways, um, right off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you where they are. There are a few. It's beginning to happen, but they are the rarity by far. Um, and, and, you know, not to, not to be at all critical of the senior pastor you were working under, the fact is most pastors have not been prepared by seminary or Bible school education. There's not a lot of preparation, very little understanding of how addiction works. Um, but, but think about this for just a second, just as an aside. Um, when I was growing up, because I'm 58 years old now, so when I was doing youth ministry, it was back in the 70s when I was on campus, and I was doing high school youth ministry at the University of Missouri, and... Um, in those days, people like me that became compulsive around sex, with sex, was probably similar to the percentages of, of guys that maybe found alcohol or, or drugs. And there's always been some sexual compulsives in, um, in, um, in human history. Mm -hmm. So my friend Nate, Nate Larkin at Samson Society, uh, you know, they, they pegged Samson, the judge of, of the Old Testament, as being a sex addict. And I'd come to that conclusion myself. Hmm. If you look at his history in the book of Judges, Samson's got an interesting vulnerability around women, and he always has to have a female companion, and it becomes his undoing. And that's not to denigrate women whatsoever. There was a, there was a deficiency in Samson's soul, and the way he connected, the way he used his sexuality was hmm. unhealthy, and it was a coping mechanism. Okay, so there's always been a few of us that have stumbled into compulsive sex. But in, a, in, in, in modern history, things began to change with first the print revolution of, of, of the sex revolution in the 60s, then VHS tapes in the 80s, and then the Internet in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you've got uh, this, this amazing amount of sexualized material, erotic material that's available on a scope and a 24-7 and and individual controlled basis that's never happened in human history. Mm -hmm. You couple that availability with a second dynamic and it's this. Unlike alcohol or drugs, human beings have a much, much bigger vulnerability around sex mm. because sex mirrors our spirituality. It mirrors the fact that we're wired to be connected to others. We think as sexual people. Our sexuality is a good thing, a God-given thing. It's a part of how we connect, but we live in a disordered world where things don't work right. We all have a sin nature. We're all somewhat broken anyway, and so we're extremely vulnerable around sex. So you give that human vulnerability this unbelievable access to erotic material, both professionally produced and now amateur produced that's accessible in so many different formats and you get to control it and you get to have it whenever you want. We've created this dynamic where all kinds of people who never meant to become an addict mm -hmm. uh, are, are first misusing their sexuality. It's natural, it's, it's curious, and they stumble into it and then a huge number of them are becoming compulsive. They, they pick up a habit that now they're having a hard time breaking. Well, church is not prepared and is too often unwilling to face that dynamic. Mm. So what we've got is an enormous percentage of people that are sitting in churches that are struggling with compulsive behaviors, but they figured out what you found out. Nobody here knows how to help me. And if I raise my hand and say, hey, I think i got a problem, because it's threatening, because sex is something that's so personal and so intimate, and because we don't want to have a mess, you get told, shut up or go away, or you know that's not right, or you just need to trust Jesus more, or what's the matter with your faith? If you had more faith or more obedient, this would not be a problem. Mm. Those are classic messages that force people to go underground and hide, where their addiction just gets fueled all the more. And they start believing those lies. There's something wrong with me. If people really knew who I was, they would run the other way. And, and we're just creating a bunch of sexual addiction in the church rather than helping people solve it. That's what I think.
Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the podcast this week. I want to encourage you to check out our website, purelifepodcast.com, for a lot of great blogs and resources and podcasts from previous episodes to help you along in your journey for sexual purity. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on our website, iTunes and Stitcher Radio. And if you need to contact me for any reason, if you have questions or comments, email me at frank at purelifepodcast.com. That's frank at purelifepodcast.com. See you next week.